All right, sorry about that. Let's get, let's, uh, get started right now. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out. Um, we're going to be talking about Istio Ambient and, uh, and, and its security properties. My name is Christian Posta. I'm a global field CTO at Solo.io. And I've been working on Istio since, actually before May 2017. So I've been part of the founding community, been around for a little bit. Um, Mr. John? I'm John Howard. I'm a software engineer at Google. I also work on Istio. I've been working on Istio for about four years now. I'm a member of the Technical Oversight Committee. Uh, and excited to talk about Ambient Mesh a bit more. Awesome. Before we get started, I want to ask the audience uh, a couple quick questions. The first is, how many people that are here are using Istio today? Wow. OK. <laughs> when I first asked this question in the summer of 2017, it was like blank stares. Um, I think for each one of you that raised your hand, there's probably like a, a few hundred out there in the uh, open source project that uh, you represent. And I want to thank you all for using Istio and pushing on it and reporting issues and helping make it better, um, kind of covering some of those edge cases that we otherwise would probably wouldn't have seen in, a, in an enterprise setting. So thank you all for, uh, for, for using Istio and your contributions. The second question I have is, how many people have heard of ambient mesh or ambient mode? Okay, all right, good. Um, we will leave resources and links at the end for, uh, for those of you that haven't. And I think in the roadmap session, we'll cover it a little bit more. But this session is specifically going to focus on the security properties of, uh, of the ambient mode and, uh, and how it compares to what you would see in, in sidecars and, and the default mode right now. So the question and the title of the talk is, is ambient mesh secure? And the answer is yes. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> we can take questions. <laughs> all right, but let's go in uh, a little bit deeper and, uh, and dig, dig into it a little bit. Like I said, I'm not, it's not an intro to ambient, but I do want to describe the, uh, what, it, what it is for a second and, uh, and why we started working on it. And uh, so Istio Ambient Mesh is a sidecarless data plane option for the Istio service mesh that we know and, and love. A big part of why we uh, started building this was to simplify how we onboard applications and get workloads into the mesh without having to inject sidecars and make changes to the deployments and, and so on, and how we run the, those workloads and, and, and eventually operate on Istio in day two, how we do upgrades and uh, CVE patching and so on, solving for some of those pesky little uh, corner cases where you're deploying your applications and you see a, a race condition between the sidecar and, or sidecar proxy and your workloads. So by eliminating the sidecar, we can, we can uh, uh, get rid of some of those, uh, those issues and make it easier to to patch and upgrade Istio because it's all running outside of the application. Some secondary benefits that we do get from Istio Ambient include things, since we're running fewer proxies, we, uh, you know, we don't have to reserve as many resources for, uh, for, the, for the sidecars, and in certain cases we can improve performance. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that and share some numbers around performance in the, in the roadmap. So those are some of the high, high level reasons why we started working on this approach. Uh, like I said, I'll leave, I'll leave uh, material and links at the end for, for you to uh, dig in more. But we're gonna talk about it from the, the security standpoint because the way ambient mesh has been implemented to facilitate the goals that we were looking uh, to, to achieve is we separated out the data plane into two distinct layers. The first layer focuses on the security aspects of the mesh, and the second layer focuses, which lives on top of uh, this, this secure overlay, uh, focuses more on the layer seven capabilities that you would expect out of, uh, out of a service mesh. Now, probably the number one reason why people start looking at adopting a service mesh is around security and achieving certain, you know, zero trust type, uh, type posture for compliance reasons, regulatory, and so on. Um, and so what we've done with Ambient is make it fairly 
uh, straightforward and easy to uh, to onboard the uh, the security aspects of, of the mesh. And that's the secure overlay. And as you start to look closer at some of the details, you'll see that that component that's represented with the with the Z tunnel that lives on each of the hosts in a in a cluster actually starts to push the, that functionality a little closer down into the uh, into the CNI or into the networking layers. Uh, so it's we, we remove it from the uh, the the applications. We don't have to deploy it as a, a sidecar, and it runs on uh, on each of the the hosts. And like I mentioned, the the layer seven capabilities are implemented in this waypoint proxy layer. I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but just note that this is an additional additional uh, uh, layer that goes on top of the secure overlay. And um, you know, for for time reasons in this talk, we're probably not going to cover it too much. But again, I'm going to leave a uh, the leave behind. So let's let's take a look at the way the uh, a, a, what a request path or a connection path might look like in the sidecar approach to the data plane versus what we've done now in, uh, in Ambient. So the first thing that you'll probably recognize is that when you install the sidecar or inject the sidecar next to your application, the application needs to somehow t uh, force its traffic through the sidecar so that it can apply the, uh, the mesh behaviors. And in the, in the most default mode, the most, I guess, user-friendly, uh, expedient mode, when you deploy the sidecar, we run some IP tables that does some redirection in the, in the pod so that the traffic from the application uh, container will make it to the, uh, to the sidecar. Now, there's other uh, modes that you can run. You can run a CNI plugin that will take care of that stuff outside of the pod ahead of time. Uh, but generally, it's the redirection that happens inside the pod that forces the traffic through the sidecar. And when you look at a diagram of how traffic moves from one pod to the other, certainly across the cluster, you'll, you'll see that the, uh, you know, things like zero, the zero trust, the um, MTLS and authorization policies, are, these, are, these are enabled at, uh, at, at that sidecar level. And so this is kind of what, what that diagram would look like. Now in ambient mode, what we've done is we've replaced, we've removed the sidecars, as I mentioned, we've replace that with uh, a component called the Z-Tunnel. And the Z-Tunnel is uh, not a full representation of what you see in the sidecar. It's not a full-blown layer seven proxy. It, we, the the Z-Tunnel just handles opening connections and establishing mutual TLS. And so obviously it will need workload certificates and it'll map the workloads to uh, certain certificates and, and then open the connection across the, uh, across the network to you know, a destination uh, a workload that terminates with an, another Z tunnel living on a, on a host. And this tunnel that we see here is, uh, is created using an HTTP based overlay. Uh, you might hear the term HBONE, that's the acronym for, uh, for how we've implemented this. Um, but the, the Z tunnel, all it does is it's a, it's a very, very focused small a uh, piece of uh, infrastructure that is just responsible for opening these connections and establishing mutual TLS. Now the interesting bit uh, in terms of implementation details you may be hearing about, may have seen a blog about, is that we didn't use Envoy to implement this. Uh, what we found is uh, actually writing this as a custom, a custom component to solve just this problem and keep, keep the surface area a um, surface of attack uh, very low and, uh, and, and tight is we, we've written this component in Rust and uh, again written to be very focused on this, uh, on this use case. And so if you compare what you have deployed in a sidecar and all of the capabilities that come along with it to what the Z tunnel looks like, you'll see that um, you know, we, don't, we don't do any of the complex layer seven handling um, you know, all of the various protocols that you'll see in Envoy, MongoDB, and Kafka, and Redis, all that stuff, that doesn't exist. Um, and typically where you see this complex layer seven handling and, and, and the complexity is where, you know, the opportunity for vulnerab vulnerabilities might show up. And as I, as I mentioned, we want to keep this, uh, this Z-Tunnel component as small and compact and focused and, uh, and keep the attack surface as, uh, as small as possible. Uh, I can't remember. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're going to go in kind of a deep dive of the different attack surfaces and compare and contrast how sidecars and the ambient mode uh, handle these and what security properties they do or do not hold. But when talking about security, it's always useful to kind of contextualize, like, what is our actual attack vectors? What are we trying to protect against? Um, like, an analogy that I like to use is, like, you can have a block or a super secure lock, but if you have a open door next next to it, it doesn't matter, right? So we actually need to understand like where are the attack vectors, what are we trying to protect against, and then we can accurately compare and contrast them. So kind of the system boundaries that we typically talk about here are the node, the pod, and then the actual applic application containers. So the node provides one of the strongest boundaries in this. Um, each node is very strongly isolated, right? They can only really connect to other nodes over the network. Um, that's a lot of where Easter's value is, that cross-network or cross-node traffic is MTLS encrypted, we can apply policies, et cetera. When we start moving down into the other layers, the lines are a bit more blurred. So a pod is generally seen as kind of this isolated unit, but really containers in Linux and Kubernetes actually don't provide a super strong security boundary. They do provide some boundaries, but it's not as strong as a node boundary, for example. And within a pod, the actual containers, if you have multiple containers, have an even weaker boundary. So in a typical pod with Istio, you would have a sidecar and then the application container. Those share a network namespace, which means that they actually are completely on the same network. They can actually access each other's local host, et cetera. And while by default they share, or they have their own file systems and process namespaces, et cetera, those can actually be merged and the lines can really get blurred. So there's kind of this uh, decreasing amount of boundaries as we, as we go into the system, uh, which is important to understand. Um, the other thing is like, what are the blast radiuses of these boundaries? In general, we're looking at one is like a node attack. If someone uh, malicious gets access to the node, maybe they have root access on the node, what kinds of things can they do? Another one would be if the actual data plane itself, the Z tunnel or the Envoy, is compromised, whether that's some remote uh, you know, arbitrary code ex execution vulnerability or something more partial vulnerability, some way they've compromised the data plane. Um, another one is the application, very similar just with the application instead of the proxy. This could also be things like a supply chain exploit where they've injected malicious code into the application you didn't notice and you deployed it to prod and now it's doing unexpected things. So we're gonna go through each of these situations and kind of compare and contrast direct head to head of uh, ambient and sidecar and how they, what kind of properties they give. So if we look at a compromised node, um, like I said, the node provides kind of one of the strongest security boundaries. So compromising the node is a huge target and gives you a lot of privileges, right? This is something you do not want to happen. <laughs> So if you have access to the node, you can view all requests without encryption, right? You can do a TCP dump on the node and see what's going on. Uh, why this applies to sidecars is not super intuitive. I have another slide right after this that's gonna do a deep dive into that. Uh, if you're root on the node, you can also do anything you want with the proxy. You could stop it, you could start your own one, you could change the code that's running there, you could start your own pods, like you have access to kubelet, which is a highly privileged component, right? And because, like I said, you have access to Kubelet, you could also do anything with identities running on the node. So Kubernetes does scope the privileges of a node to only things on that node. So it's not like you compromise one node and you have control of the entire cluster. Um, but it is, you can do anything on that node is within your purview. So sidecars and ambient really do not provide much difference here in protection. If your node is compromised, generally everything on that node is also compromised. So specifically with kind of the network inspection, if you look at this diagram, it intuitively looks kind of like sidecars are more secure in this aspect. Like the green line is longer or the red line is longer on ambient, right? So it must be less secure. Uh, but in practice, this is not really the case because if you have access to the node and you can do like a TCP dump on the node, for example, then you also have privilege to go enter the pod and do a TCP dump within the pod network namespace as well. So while intuitively it may seem like there's this boundary, the fact is that the node compromises an extremely high privilege and it can do a lot of things on the node. So in practice, there's no tangible difference between these two from a security posture. 
Next thing would be a kind of a compromise of the data plane. They don't have access to the entire node, but they've found some sort of exploit in Envoy or Z-Tunnel, and they're using that to do malicious things. So in general, in this case, they can configure that data plane to do arbitrary things, potentially, right? So they could send requests that you didn't initiate, they could mutate your request, they could block your request, whatever. This is generally the same in sidecars and ambient, with one caveat that there's kind of different types of exploits, right? If you have a complete remote code execution, you can potentially do anything. But like Christian mentioned, the Z-Tunnel itself has much less code in it that's doing much, many fewer things. So there's a lot of areas, if you had a partial exploit, that you could use existing code in Envoy to do malicious things. Well, the Z-Tunnel just doesn't actually do that many things. So if you have a partial exploit, it may be harder to uh, exploit it. The other is issue we're looking at is certificates. So in a sidecar, a, the actual proxy has access to one certificate for the service count of the pod. And so if the data plan is compromised, they could mint new certificates for that identity, but they don't have access to other identities running on other pods, right? The issue, though, is that generally, if you're able to compromise Envoy, it's not specific to one specific application. Right? It's an issue in the data plane itself, which is run in all of your applications. Right? You run the same sidecar everywhere. And so the attack is most likely replayable, such that this scoping of which certificates you're able to mint new certificates for is unlikely to remain scoped. Um, in Ambient, it's a pretty similar story. The difference, though, is that in Ambient, the Z-Tunnel itself is responsible for all the identities on its node. So if you're only able to exploit one single uh, data plane instance, you would have a larger scope of certificates that you could compromise. Again, though, this is scoped to a single node, not the entire cluster. That is all the pods, this, all the pods running on that node at that time. All right, next up would be a compromised application. Um, so like I said, this could be someone remotely exploited your code or even you just had some supply chain attack where they injected some code that you didn't, you didn't know would be there. So in this case, the application can do completely arbitrary things depending on what the attack was. There's nothing that a sidecar or ambient can do to change your application's behavior, right? We're just there to sit uh, at the border of your application. Um, however, in the sidecar, because the application and the proxy are running in the same pod, they're in the same trust boundary, and like I said, that boundary is very blurry. So the proxy or the application can do a lot of things, like stop the proxy replace the proxy with their own, bypass the proxy so the requests don't go through it. Um, in Ambient, this is not really possible because the Z-Tunnel is in a completely separate trust boundary that's enforced at a different layer. So the pod actually doesn't have permission to stop the Z-Tunnel or to stop redirection to the Z-Tunnel, et cetera. Um, the other thing is that because the boundary for identity in Kubernetes is a pod, while only the sidecar proxy actually needs a certificate to do things, the application implicitly gets permission to mint its own certificates. So they could similarly uh, mint new certificates just like the data plan exploit we talked about previously. On the other hand, in Ambient, the actual application pods do not need any privilege at all to get MTLS certificates. Only the Z-Tunnel and the waypoints, which we'll talk about later, need this privilege. So generally, we can remove that privilege from applications. Uh, another one is if a completely separate node or application from you is compromised. In this case, luckily, both Sidecar and Ambient provide the same uh, security guarantees that that application may be doing things that you didn't expect, but we can at least cryptographically verify who they are and apply policies to prevent them from doing things that we don't expect. Finally would be a compromise of the control plane. This is mostly for completeness. The control plane completely programs the data plane's behavior, and so it can make it do arbitrary things, remove all your policies, et cetera, and this applies both to sidecars and ambient. Finally, we get to the waypoint proxy. Like Christian said, we don't have enough time to do a deep dive into the waypoint, um, but at a high level, the waypoint proxy is doing one. It's doing end-to-end -end, uh, MTLS from uh, the, you know, the original client through the Z-Tunnel, through the waypoint, back to the Z-Tunnel, into the application. And it's within the same trust boundary as the server that deploys it. So that's a very, very high level summary, but we also feel the waypoint proxy is as secure as sidecars. If you want to learn more, there's a link here at the bottom and I think also at the end that gives kind of a deep dive, more in discussion about the waypoint proxy.
Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, and so wrapping up here in the last few minutes that we have, um, hopefully it's come across that uh, in, in a lot of these different attack modes or you know, the blast radius between comparing between the sidecar and uh, an Istio ambient mode is that the ambient mode is as secure as the sidecar approach. However, there is actually one big difference. And I mentioned it in the beginning. I'm curious how many people picked up on it. If you look at, um, at, a, at a deployment of, let's say, in a single cluster across multiple nodes with sidecar, you have you know, the proxies deployed uh, out with, uh, with all the workloads. You have the control plane. And you compare it to a similar diagram of how Istio Ambient is deployed. What's one big difference between those two diagrams? Shout it out. Fewer resources, yes? What else? Fewer, fewer attack vectors? The data plane is not running with the applications, right? And as I mentioned in the beginning, the motivating reason for building Ambient was to improve operations and to improve our ability to upgrade and patch the data plane and, and, and the service mesh. And that's extremely important, being able to quickly patch vulnerabilities when they're found without impacting the applications is hugely important for keeping your security posture uh, safe. All right, so there is a big difference between ambient and, uh, and the sidecar. Ease of operations is that, uh, is, is that difference. So we're running, we've run out of time. Um, I wanna leave some additional resources and, uh, and how to reach us. Uh, we will be around here for the rest of uh, Istio Day, so happy to take questions. And I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming out listening to this first session.